keep, keep this up. Uh, welcome everybody for um, Alisa workshop um, number eight. And we are gonna talk about a bit about um, different workshops and um, different working groups and what we do. Um, here's a bit of a organizational overview um, to think about. Um, we, um, and we'll go through the mission statement a little bit and then the schedule as well. Um, a bit, let's start with a bit of a uh, antitrust policy that we have here at um, LF. Um, project meetings involve participation, participation by industry competitors and it is the intention of the Linux Foundation to conduct all of these activities in accordance with applicable antitrust and co um, competition laws. Um, you can read about that on here. And um, we uh, conduct various meetings um, in, in, in connection with Linux Foundation activities. We, we follow the antitrust um, policy. Code of conduct, um, all participants are expected to behave in accordance with the professional standards with both uh, uh, the Linux Foundation code of conduct as well as their respective um, employers policies and guidelines. So we would like uh, for you to follow the same thing for this workshop as well. Um, we, there are a few things to think about since we are uh, participating virtually, um, virtual culture. If you want to um, ask questions while presently is talking, write a comment in the chat box or turn on your camera and then wait for a logical break, break for them to follow up. Um, keep yourself muted unless you are participating in an active discussion. And if there is a problem with the session, some background noise, direct message via chat to the host, they can mute the participants. If you are a presenter and, and the room is getting empty, consider summing up your presentation. If you feel more uh, need to work together, get the names of those if interested and work with LF staff to arrange a follow-up virtual meeting at a later date. Do not spam the other participants in your session and make sales pitches. Suggestions on how to improve work or workshop would be, are all, always welcome. And we are continuing to, um, we have been doing this for a couple of sessions now, unfortunately, with the current situation that we have that we cannot, um, get together uh, in person. So um, any improvements you want to make, um, let us know. And please take notes and share with the organizers um, in the survey. Um, licensing for this workshop, it is CC by 4.0. Um, you can take a look at this, um, uh, what is creativecommons.org. You can take a look at uh, the details on that. And we, uh, it is a uh, share, adapt, and uh, attribution, we give attribution and no additional restrictions will apply. You can take a look at this license in detail. Um, okay, let's get to the session, important uh, session uh, details here. Um, newcomer presentation is um, already happened. Uh, Philip and Ilana, thank you for doing that. And right now we are uh, doing a general welcome and, um, and then also established work group updates. We'll do that. And then you can, you, there is a other sessions following this one, um, evolution of the development process working group um, by Paul and Ilana. They will talk about how we evolved the development work process working group. Um, they'll give you details on the future directions uh, for that. And we'll be talking about um, uh, Linux in safety systems and EVBF ver verifier. And, and more to come, um, uh, Brandon and I are talking about uh, kernel testing frameworks um, and uh, discovery um, followed by, it looks like I have another talk there, discovering Linux kernel subsystems um, used by OpenAPS. This is for the medical um, devices working group. And there is more um, coming up. Please check the set schedule. And tomorrow we start bright and early again with the networking hour. Please participate, come and, um, join us there and uh, let's see and we're meeting Wednesday morning as well um, we will be talking about um, safety standards um, and and the community problem and dynamic um, memory allocation 
and so on. And then we're also uh, going to continue the conversation um, from uh, um, the code coverage angle that we are doing today. Um, Rachel Sibley is going to be talking about that. And then we're also talking about um, approach to qualification and safety targeting. Um, Gabriel will be talking about that. So yes, there is a lot to, and then we'll be wrapping up with the goal setting, which we, we do a goal setting at the end of the workshop. Um, after looking at the progress, work, we working groups and as their working group leads are bringing up issues or uh, just challenges for them. So we talk about goal setting and we uh, set goals for our next quarter. That's usually we wrap that up. And okay, a little bit of a project orientation. Uh, we'll talk about what is it. Um, we are looking at um, enabling Linux in safety critical systems. That's our mission. We are assessing whether the system is safe, uh, assessing the system, whether the system is safe requires understanding the system. That is the only way you can do this. And understanding Linux within that system and system meaning you're running Linux on a system. What does it have? What kind of hardware components does it have? What kind of drivers does it use? And so on. Um, we like to understand different components, interactions between the subsystems, Linux subsystems, and, and also uh, selecting Linux components and features that can be evaluated for safety. Maybe a um, particular system might be heavy using um, a particular uh, feature of Linux. And we want to look at that particular feature and see what components make to that feature and what are the safety angles we need to look at in that subsystem. And we also like to identify the gaps, meaning we might not have um, a, a proper documentation for the subsystem, for example, or it does not have a good regression test for that matter. And then we identify, we'd like to identify those gaps and see how we can uh, connect the dots between uh, the technology that we have. Um, it's been under um, use by 30 years, for about 30, well, 30 years now, and then take that and see how we can ma map in the, and evaluate safety um, and connect the dots. So we have um, a Telisa project that is the challenge for us uh, to make it easier for companies to build and certify Linux-based um, safety critical applications and systems as well. You can, um, there is a white paper out um, on the ELISA website. You can take a look in detail um, and how we are um, going about doing this, advancing open source uh, safety critical systems. And we define and maintain a common set of elements and processes and tools that can be incorporated into specific Linux-based safety critical systems. Um, so as, um, uh, integrators are looking at um, enabling uh, Linux on safety data system, individual systems. We like to, we would like to provide, a, maintain, um, we would provide a common set of elements and processes that can be incorporated. Say, how do we, um, say, for example, how do we verify that the system is for safety? So we would. Uh, we provide a set of processes and tools for them to be able to do that uh, effectively. Um, so a bit about collaboration, um, understanding the limits. We have to be able to understand um, that we cannot engineer um, our system to be safe. So we cannot ensure uh, that uh, you know how to apply the described process and methods. Uh, cannot, we cannot uh, take an out of tree uh, Linux kernel for safety critical upscale, cannot create one. We don't create, we are not in the business of, business of creating a distro or a out of tree uh, Linux kernel for safety. Um, we also keep in mind that as rele new releases come in, it is a continuous process of improving argument. Like for example, a new release comes in, what are the new changes that happened? Or what kind of new um, 
features might have gotten added or a feature existing feature might have been enhanced. So all of the keeping up with the continuous development model that we have with Linux. And we cannot relieve you, more importantly, um, from the legal standpoint, we cannot re relieve you from your responsibilities and legal obligations and liabilities. But we are able to provide a path forward, forward um, collaborating with peers. That's what we can do at ELISA. So please join our community. Um, you can participate um, joining the mailing list. We have uh, several mailing lists, one for the technical steering committee that um, we have, work, each working group has um, a mailing list and uh, ambassadors group um, as well. And um, you can participate in any of those capacities. You can participate in uh, uh, various working groups. Um, and then also collaborate in workshops like this we hold every quarter. So, um, so let's uh, talk a little bit into a little bit about the technical strategy. I really want to get to the working group established working group uh, updates. Um, our work, working group leads can talk about what they have done are, are going to be doing in the next few months. Okay, so um, we, uh, what are our deliverables? Our deliverables are we develop example, um, qualitative analysis for automotive, medical. Those are the two is, use cases we are looking at. We are always looking at other use cases to use industrial maybe and others um, for a Linux kernel. And we provide resources for system integrators to apply and use the analysis quantitatively and qualitatively on their systems. For example, uh, we are um, analyzing, we have analyzed um, published um, CWs to identify hazards and it's an ongoing process. We are continuing to do that um, uh, as we develop, um, more, uh, take the CWs and see how we can um, identify hazards um, pertain to the safety and how we can, uh, what are the mitigators uh, that we can use for each of the CWs in terms of maybe um, detecting them early on during compile phase uh, with FN analyzer features um, GCC has and other features that are compile stage. And then also uh, looking to see what we can use in terms of kernel features. So system integrators will use these deliverables and, and analyze their systems. The reason for that is we do not have, we do not know at ELISA um, what would be the different components um, um, system integrators are dealing with. Um, that is an unknown to us. Um, so the way that we work is we provide um, information for them to be able to make the right decisions for their individual systems. Okay, so we have um, all of these working groups here, automated work, working group and medical uh, devices working group. And those feed into safety architecture working group uh, direction uh, to kind of look at, they give us, they tell us, okay, let's look at these, tell the other working groups say, hey, let's focus on this um, and see. This is the um, subsystem we want you to take a look at in closely. And we have open source. Um, we'll, next talk, um, Paul and Ilana will get into these uh, uh, working groups, open source engineering class working group and Linux features for safety. And we also have a tools investigation and code improvement working group. They, the, they, are, they work um, uh, to, they, Lucas and, and the group, they are working to bridge the gap in a uh, practical way uh, between the kernel community and safety um, um, engineers. What experts, what they do is they also um, uh, get new developers into uh, working with the kernel signing patches and so on. So, and that all, all of these working groups make up um, who we are we are continuously working to, um, to working towards delivering, give, do, putting together our deliverables for system integrators to use. 
uh, technical steering committee, we, uh, we define and finalize in technical strategy in, in our, we are continuously looking at uh, strategy and say, hey, are we still aligned with our goals? And are we uh, making progress in the direction that we, that is, that works for us? And as we have uh, new um, use cases show up, are we still aligned with, um, with uh, uh, the direction we are going? in. Uh, we publish white papers on ELISA uh, website, uh, ELISA tech website. You can um, take a look at that. And we also have Git that we publish our work and we review our work um, and make changes. Um, let's see. So um, you can take a look at that on the, to read the white paper that we have up on the Elisa website. So let me go to automated working group. Do I have Jochen? Jochen, unfortunately, is not available. So I'll take over. I hope it's in there because I just put in my slides before oh, the session. Okay. Otherwise, I will just simply share. Just, just do one click. If it's not there on the next slide, then. Oh. Okay. Now then, it's, uh, me, it's in the latest version of it. Oh, okay. Okay. So um, if you don't mind, I will shortly just yeah, open can... it. Would you like to share? I just share. I think it's the easiest one. Give me a second. I interrupt your... Oh, answer. no worries. No worries. Um, okay. I'll stop share. And you okay, great. Go on. So I will share screen number two. Going in and share. Present. So uh, we, I'll keep it short based on what you shortly wanted to mention that we are currently looking into the telltale use case, but telltale does not ring a bell to a lot of people. So it's basically about these indicators, which are in this orange boxes. The traditional one are with LEDs, and nowadays they are with rendered images. Uh, the nice thing about this use case is that we have really relaxed timings of above 100 milliseconds, which reduces demands to kernel, and we can have a very close collaboration with the AGL. What we currently do is that we start with an STPA analysis of the telltale use case. Uh, we found this useful because we were into a lot of technical details in the beginning, and we now look about all the elements. How do elements interact? Where is potential faults coming in? Where is the harm? Where is risk? And uh, this ongoing activity, you can learn more about the STPA in the next sessions during the days. Uh, then we are trimming down currently our kernel configuration. We did this uh, already by like five or 500 entries, roughly more or less, which we took away from the standard AGL uh, cluster demo. And everything which we do, we provide on the GitHub. So we are contributing uh, and updating our process there so that you can really get a start or we always look for a review who checks that whatever we make as documentation is there and support also the onboarding activities we found this useful because we have a lot of new people joining and it's not good to do it verbally all the time it's much better to have the documentation updated and regularly maintained the next activities which we plan are uh, to continue with STP stpa for the telltale use case then we uh, will coordinate again with Otosa. We did this a few months back. We had to stop there, but uh, we recently started all over again. So we will outreach to Otosa group, safety group, to talk about OS-related topics. And uh, actually, we figure we need to look for more OEMs to join the group because <laughs> it's BMW and Toyota mainly visible and uh, acting in the group. So we want to get more in there. Uh, and in order to reach out, we will go into the up AGL, so have the upcoming changes there, and uh, develop the demo further and make it more robust. So uh, to maybe change from a Qt app to Rust version of it, so there's some interest in there. This is about the automotive working group update, and I will stop sharing so that you can take over again, Shua. Thank you, Philip. Um, let me share screen again. 
Okay, next um, is up we have is medical devices working group. Kate, would you like to sure. speak to this? Yep, I will. And um, so with medical group, uh, devices group, we've been pretty much uh, wrapping up our level two STP analysis. We've been working in spreadsheets here on this as well as the diagram. I don't think we've had any major changes in our, our level two diagram. And at this point, we're now pretty much transitioning into the level three um, work, uh, which is the Raspbian interfaces into the kernel. And so as part of this, um, there's been a lot of work on the tracing and um, figuring out what is going to be happening with the kernel and the components there. So there'll be more um, details for those who are interested in a session at 14, sorry, 1630 UTC, which um, is in a couple of hours from now on um, looking at the Linux kernel subsystems in Shua and Milan will be um, going into much more detail in that session. Um, as far as the workers group is concerned, the next steps are to complete the publishing of our analysis on GitHub and submit it into the TSC for further review. And for those who are curious about what um, system theoretic process analysis is or STPA, I've included the link to the handbook. Um, you'll be hearing more about that from, I think, from the automotive group and ourselves as well. Thanks. You want to go to the Thank next one, Shima? Yes. Thank you, Kate. Sure. Um, we have a software working group. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm on the call. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gabriel. Okay. So, yeah, I'm uh, Gabriele Pauloni, so lead of the uh, architecture uh, working group in Elisa. So, as Shua mentioned earlier, basically, our, basically what we do is we take uh, technical safety requirements uh, from the domain specific working group like the medical devices working group and the automotive working group and we derive a functional and safety requirement for the kernel itself okay so while the automotive working group now is working on a, um, an alternative approach using stpa we are continuing our uh, analysis uh, based on the previous concept, okay, that was using like a more uh, traditional uh, analysis based on the system level architecture, okay. So effectively, so what we did is we um, basically we went uh, quite far with the uh, FMEA analysis of the VFS subsystem with respect to the uh, use case of uh, uh, wash talk set them out. Okay, so we identified the safety critical code to be qualified. And the main feedback from the people was that then now was time to focus on the uh, freedom from interference claim. So uh, in order, uh, you know, to define, uh, you know, the qualification activities, we should also be able to prove uh, you know, uh, a, a freedom from interference, both uh, at kernel level uh, or um, and at user space level. Okay, so, and this is why we start uh, now uh, another uh, uh, activities. So uh, we are uh, we are working on the uh, freedom from interference analysis, both uh, on the kernel side, and uh, we have mobilized that in this regard is driving uh, this approach. And they also pushed the core tree tool and the funk parser uh, tool that are um, usable, you know, to, to support the kernel code uh, classification first and, and, and then also the freedom from interference. Um, also, uh, with respect to the user space freedom from interference, um, the main uh, problem that we are looking at is on how the uh, kernel um, support the integrity of the uh, processes address space. Okay, so effectively, um, uh, one of the key properties is the you know the, the integrity of the uh, address space of the safety application. Okay, how how, how does the kernel uh, support that integrity? So this is the, this is the first claim that we need to uh, to look at, and then as a second step, we'll uh, We'll also look at the uh, 
freedom from interference between the safety application address space and other uh, uh, address spaces of application with uh, with lower ACU. Okay. So yeah, and this is uh, what we are doing right now. And uh, at the end of the workshop, we'll present the the goals for for the next uh, quarter. Okay. And that's it. Thank you, Gab. Okay, next up is the Open Source Engineering Process Working Group. Paul, would you like to um, speak to this? Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Paul Albatella uh, and I'm the chair of the OSEP group, um, which has started relatively recently. Um, I'll be talking about uh, where it came from because it was an evolution of the development process working group in, in the, the next session. Um, but our, our goal is, is, is looking at an overall approach to, to safety processes for, for systems using using Linux. Um, we identified as part of the work with the, the previous working group that, that because Linux development practices don't map to the, the reference process that you see in safety standards, we need a way to, to, to bridge that gap. Um, and so we're looking at how FOSS developers and product creators can, can provide equivalent confidence with, with different um, practices and, and processes. So for example, um, Gab was talking about uh, doing the freedom from interference um, analysis there. And so we'd be looking at the, um, the, the processes that you did use, you'd use to, to, to kind of make that claim and, and what sort of evidence you want to support it in order to, um, to map to the sort of, sort of uh, things that the standards would expect. Um, so we're trying to uh, apply uh, some of these approaches to, to some specific topics uh, for Linux. And the first one we're looking at is um, stack memory protection, which is in, in a similar sort of area to, to the one that um, Gab was talking about. Um, but you can you can learn some more about what we're doing uh, and what our goals are at the uh, the next session. Thank you, Paul. And uh, next up is Ilana. Um, Ilana, would you like to speak to this, or um, you you would be I think covering a lot of that in the next upcoming session, your session. I cannot see Alana okay. amongst the participants. Okay, no worries. Um, Paul and Ilana are um, holding a session later on today um, or tomorrow um, talking about uh, development, um, uh, the evolution of development working process, process working group and how we refined um, the working group um, activities um, to work better for us uh, to be able to for, to be able to effectively uh, deliver uh, and work towards ELISA goals and then deliverables. All right, um, next up is Lucas. Lucas, would you like to talk about what you're doing in the tools investigation and code improvement working group? Sure, um, so just to give you a quick insight into our small group. Um, so our mission is to focus on the application of tools and handling the tool results um, to improve the kernel based on the tool feedback. And roughly we have uh, four activities that are ongoing. The first one I think is actually the most important, namely that um, members that come to our group um, and haven't contributed to the kernel development beforehand um, to get um, the necessary guidance and mentoring support um, to get patches accepted. Uh, we start with uh, very low complexity changes and go into more and more complex activities. So there we actually have two newcomers that uh, successfully uh, got through that challenge, um, Milan and Mia. And of course, anyone that's interested in that can join our group and we'll guide you as well. Um, second um, activity that we are moving forward is a documentation on the tool called TechPatch, um, providing a classification, explanation, and rationales of what the tools do. And you can see that documentation um, in the usual kernel documentation place, um, kernel workstock, right? 
And the third activity is that we have a running code checker instance. Um, and we use this tool to assess dead stores that are introduced into the uh, kernel and we identify if they are intentional and shouldn't be acted on or if they are unintentional and would need um, a fix. And then we send out the fix. And the last activity is that we are fuzzing with syscaller there as well. We have a syscall instance that is running. It's finding a number of bugs for us. Those that we are able to clearly pinpoint to one specific problem with little effort, we report. And there as well, I think we have a number of success stories, um, people reacting on those and um, fixing issues. Yes, so what's the future work that we might see? Um, I'll say more about that in the presentation this afternoon, well, later, later in the day, um, called enforcing uh, enforced properties during kernel development. And if you want, if you find interest in these topics that I just reported, um, feel free to join our working group. We're certainly looking for more members and we are uh, ready to have more impact on the kernel development. Okay, thanks. I guess with that goes to the next speaker. Thank you, Lucas. Um, okay, um, I think we are at the end of the presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, um, let's open it up for questions at this point. Please uh, put your questions in the chat box or turn on your camera and ask questions. Um, any of the working uh, group leads or myself. Okay, so there is a question, which working group is working on CWE? We um, were doing the uh, CWE work in the development process working group, and we'll be picking that up um, in, in uh, Linux, uh, the new working group that we have, um, uh, Linux features working group. And we have um, analyzed several CWEs, and as well, we um, have, we are working on um, pop hopefully publishing some of that work in the future soon. Ah, good question. Um, we, um, new working groups are always welcome. Um, aviation working group, um, we, um, yes, yes, please, please feel free to propose it. And we, we welcome um, new working groups and new areas to um, apply uh, what we are doing here. Absolutely. Andreas has raised his hand too, I see. Ah, sorry. Um, go ahead, Andreas. So with uh, some of the things presented here, let's say not everything is entirely new coming out of the ELISA working group. So if you're thinking about someone actually certifying functional for, for some, sorry, certifying Linux for functional safety applications, where do you see um, ELISA currently on the road to that goal? Like between zero and 100%? Um... 
so we are um, we are making pro progress. Um, I can't give a number specifically on uh, zero to I'll, or I'll, maybe maybe one. maybe one question, Andreas. First, but I mean, what is your expectation from the Elisa, Eliza project? Right, because of course, for a certification, right, you need a person that takes over the liability. The ELISA project is never in that position. So the things that the group does is prepare material so that anyone that wants to do it to really go down the full road um, has something to st start structuring their thoughts. In that you way, right? We do agree on that, yes. Yes, okay. So then the question would be, so how far are we in helping someone to structure their thoughts? And I think the challenge here is that depends on the recipient, right? How well are they prepared to understand all the different thoughts that are raised in the project? And some of them might seem contradicting to each other, Right. And how well are they prepared to get this together and make a single argument for themselves? Um, and I think that's the, the actual challenge, um, not the results of the, let's say, that are created within the group. It's really the challenge of understanding how they can be added up into one argument. Right. So does the working group in this case also um, prepare some documentation that would be going into that direction? Because, you know, like mentoring new people, that's going to be an ongoing activity and that is never going to be done. Because absolutely. there's always going to be new people, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the things that, that we're, we're actively trying to address at the moment is is capturing the results of our discussions in, 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 to, in a form that, that people can use that um, as you say new, newcomers to, to Elisa can 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 read it and understand what we've discussed and what our conclusions were and also ultimately to, to provide materials that can, that, you know, that can actually be used as part of a, of, a, a, of a, um, a specific attempt to use uh, Linux in a safety context um, so I think we're, where we are at with that is working out how to, to structure that approach. Um, some of the some of the techniques that and, and that, that, we, that, that are useful and evaluating those and working out how how best to describe those and, and what the limits of them are, um, and uh, and beginning to kind of structure structure that kind of overall approach into something that that people can use. I guess more as a, as a as a map of how to approach it than than a you know a concrete set of steps that they that they can follow, um, and it's it's very much an, an ongoing process. And, and I think the more um, the more people we get contributing to that and, and sharing their experiences, the the more um, the more we'll be able to refine it and make it something useful. So would you say we are headed into that direction that we are ensuring that a certain 5.x version has undergone the various tests that have been described here and that therefore anyone um, that is inheriting that kernel base would be able to, you know, like take some form of text block from Eliza and then say, you know, use that in their argumentation? Or would this rather be more of a checklist that these are the um, you know recommended steps that someone should be taking on their um, you know like kernel tree and basically you know like start running those things from zero? That's a, that's a very good very good question. I think the the approach that that we've been been discussing is r rather than trying to make a set of claims for a specific version of of Linux. To, to, as you say, to identify what you need to show for your particular version of Linux for your particular um, system use case in order to make a set of claims. Um, and, and certainly speaking from my own 
people work in the in the OSEP. That's that's how we're trying to do it. We're trying to structure it by looking at what claims we'd we'd like to make about Linux in, in a system um, in a safety context, and how we can make make the arguments to support those and and find the evidence for that. Um, uh, because everyone's going to come to Linux with with a different set of requirements. Um, clearly, there's going to be a, a whole group of them that are, are fundamental and that that you know, almost everyone's going to want. Um, but but their particular use case and what constraints that that puts on it um, will will vary. So so we need to equip them with the tools to do it, rather than a safe Linux in inverted commas that they can just drop in and use straight away. Yes, um, definitely. The latter, I would say that the, what Patal is saying, what we would do is we'll provide um, guidelines uh, for the system integrators to go and evaluate their own systems because um, it several uh, good reasons for doing so, because we really do not know what is in um, the individual systems and what are the concerns for, um, for individual concerns they might have based on hardware or based on um uh, the their specific uh use case and so what we would do is we are giving them um guidance if you will um on how to achieve um certification using the the methods that we are uh, and tools not to when we say tools we make a recommendation on the tools we do not provide tools we will compile a list of tools um, to achieve that goal. So Lucas, um, have a comment uh, from Lucas. Aviation standards are quite different though. It would be interesting to understand which challenges are with aviation standards and especially how companies in the domain actually interpret the clauses and how open source fits or does not fit. Yes, that is a good point, uh, Lucas. So we, um, uh, as far as uh, aviation working uh, group, uh, aviation working group, uh, we would we really welcome uh, participation from uh, experts in that space, and so we can uh, look to see um, how we can. Uh, it'll be it'll be great to see another working uh, another space for us to look at. Because each space uh, we have currently out of even medical, they each bring their challenges, right? So it is, uh, as for me, I always like to see more um, spaces coming in and aviation, definitely. Please uh, propose a new working group. And of, and of course, that's all. I can say uh, urban legends. Um, to my understanding, Linux is already used in aviation in, in functionality, or below functionality that is safety critical. Um, and that is often uh, in the case for uh, ground control systems interacting with the uh, planes in some way and of course for that ground control system linux is employed in right in various um, computer systems unfortunately it's unclear to me what kind of argumentation they actually use there um, and if there's something of, of general interest that could be shared with others. Um, but yeah, it's urban legends that Linux is used there. I haven't really seen a, a reference anywhere. But of course, that would be interesting to learn more about if someone does have information and, and can share what kind of properties of it are of interest and what kind of um, argumentation is used or what kind of um, elements are relevant for, for, for such an aviation uh, domain. Yeah, but I guess, yeah, we're waiting for 
people from that domain to, to contribute. Thank you, Lucas. Yeah. Um, I, um, we have another um, um, important effort that happens uh, in terms of uh, compiling our uh, results and then also uh, blogs and publishing our work. Um, Min, uh, can you speak to a little bit um, about that effort, ambassador's effort? Sure. Thanks, uh, Shira. Um, so yeah, so Elisa has an ambassador program and currently we have um, 10 very active communities, community members who are ambassadors of the Elisa project. And these are many of them are also TSC voting members. Uh, so they have, uh, you know, very extensive knowledge. Uh, many of them are have been involved since the formation of the Elisa project. So they, you know, they're very knowledgeable about what Elisa uh, is trying to accomplish. Um, so there's a web page. I'm going to drop the link here um, into the chat. So if you can take a look at that. Um, so really, the ambassadors are here to educate others on the mission and goals of the project. They're here to raise awareness, visibility, and impact of the ELISA uh, community work. They're here to promote the results of use case analysis by ELISA working groups, to engage with the safety and Linux kernel community, and to bring in and onboard and mentor, in fact, many new contributors to the ELISA pro uh, com community. So um, you can see uh, we have all of the ambassadors on that page, their pictures, and uh, some of them you know, made their LinkedIn um, profiles public, or maybe their uh, GitHub, um, uh, handle public so you can definitely reach out to them that way. Um, if you are interested in participating or becoming an Elisa ambassador, there's also a, a button at the very bottom of this page to apply. Obviously, we're looking for people who have been very involved uh, and actively contributing and have good understanding of safety in general and the basics of Linux kernel and able to answer any questions. Uh, and be able to speak on behalf of ELISA events uh, and conferences. Um, really, I, I think just as Shua mentioned, right, a lot of ambassadors have been really, they, they've been presenting on behalf of ELISA, they've been regularly, um, uh, they're being authors of a lot of our blog posts. Um, so if you go to ELISA homepage and, you know, look under blogs, uh, you should be able to find a lot of content already produced and written by uh, a lot of our ambassadors. Um, they're also helping us, yeah, just to, you know, improve our website, the navi nav navigation visibility and discoverability of information on our website, uh, improving our, a lot of our um, project materials, uh, including, you know, efforts uh, started up by Zhang to kind of create a getting started guides uh, to help with, you know, others who are new to Elisa, but you know, wanting to contribute, but not sure where to start. So uh, I think all the ambassadors who have been really contributing to the Elisa project, and these are the ones in the community that you can reach out to if you, you know, you have questions about how to con contribute or want to get a little more context about what, what has happened and where is Elisa going. Um, these are the leaders in the community that, that, that are open um, and, you know, make themselves available, let's say, um, to connect with newcomers. Uh, so feel free to reach out to them. That's it, Shira. Thank you, Min. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, also join us uh, tomorrow's networking uh, session um, early in the morning, late in the afternoon in Europe. Um, okay, so we have a comment from uh, David. Um, Linux and safety aviation application. I think you would benefit from some of the D0178 experience, but from my limited perspective, I wouldn't think it viable, though happy to be proven wrong. Um, would you like to elaborate on that a little bit, David? Yeah, hi, yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm no way a, a, um, an aviation expert. My, my domain is automotive domain, but I, I really think that the um, I don't think it's currently used in, in avionics from, from my limited experience. I've got some friends and colleagues who, who work there. Um, and I, I don't think they use what we call commercial operating systems at all. 
um, and with the real time and the process constraints required from the, the standard, I, I don't know whether it would be um, practical unless it was written from scratch under a you know constrained, uh, rigorous process. That's that's where I'm coming from. But as I said, happy to be proven wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Any other no, questions? I, and uh -huh. go ahead. I would like to ask another question um, related to the architecture, the overall system architecture that that you envision. Uh, my understanding is so far, basically. Uh, Eliza has been looking into, okay, how can I run a C, C++ application or Philip mentioned uh, Rust in the other session um, and make sure that the application itself is protected from the kernel and so on. Um, what we are increasingly seeing is that, that, that implementers look into basically bringing microservice architectures with a full blown idea of, I have containers, I have an orchestrator, um, two, two domains like automotive. Um, is that something that Eliza is going to uh, look into or would you assume that basically you can take, yeah, the knowledge collected by looking at, okay, I'm running an application, a C application, Rust application directly on the kernel over to these containerized, to these orchestrated, maybe even mixed criticality use cases um, where you, you may have like, I don't know, two containers with, with different um, ASIL assignments on the, on the same system. From the uh, automotive working uh, group specifically, do, Philip, do you have any comments yeah. on that? Particular right, so we, we were just cussing this topic uh, just already before the formation of the automotive working group, especially things like containerization. Uh, it helps to put you some argumentation. Of course, you need to look into the containers and understand the container that they are working properly. And uh, then still the containers are within a Linux kernel. And this means we are back and that's where we currently focus on to look into Linux kernel argumentation into the scheduling and so on, because this is also where how the memory is handled. And in this way, a container can help you in some argumentation, but it also adds a little bit of complexity on top. So you need to find the trade-off between a, where to use a containerization or and where it brings in the benefit and what you can analyze so that you say, okay, yes, a container really adds something for safety or security, but also think it's relevant. And um, so here's about trade-off. So we were discussing it, but currently we are more in a state that we say, let's analyze our system uh, from the use case, which we have, it may not be needed as we're looking for the simplest telltale use case but the original concept from the telltale use case already included containerization um that we said we can start without using it so i guess if we evolve there it may be an option to get in um you know, if this brings a good picture um philip yeah um i just hi it's ilana here i just joined I'm in parallel and whatever work things, but um, I would add just to what you said that what Eliza is trying to do is to provide building blocks. So obviously at the end of the day, you, you um, people deploy systems, especially in automotive systems are highly complex, but for purpose of analysis, we break it down into building blocks and work with individual aspects, individual elements, individual processes, tools, and we are hoping with time and with additional contributors, and I see that happening in my own work, we take back from what we contribute and put it together in different ways to develop the actual systems which we deploy. So I don't think Eliza can deal with the complexity of the architecture which you described, which definitely reflects real life, you know, automotive architecture, but Definitely, we are providing um, analysis and elements and focusing on different aspects of the, those complex systems to enable you to go back and put the pieces together in whatever way is, is relevant for your specific use case. Would that then mean this... in concrete that uh, you would be looking at the C group isolation layer and not the higher level orchestration? Or where would you draw the line? 
Um, currently, we, we are not even on the level of this Siruba. I have a talk um, this week that I'm going to introduce isolation techniques to help um, bring us in that direction. But the, the focus currently are on individual elements, as you said, such as the C group or, or you know, lower level um, features of the, the, the Linux architecture, the kernel architecture, which are useful for the analysis. And C groups, namespaces definitely are, are typical examples. And then the, the question is how we analyze those from a, a safety point of view and then how we put, and then you get to go back and to say, how do I put that all together to, to, to solve my specific um, use case? So that's where the challenge comes in. Um, okay, Understood. but it's a question of scaling up, yeah. Yeah, so the, one of the reasons why I, I brought this up is that those um, containerized architectures aren't really driven by security or safety to start with. They are more like, okay, I want to work like I can work in the data center or in the cloud, you know, uh, isolate microservices, develop stuff in isolation, test it in the cloud, test it on a laptop, bring it in the car. So it's it's more of a process driven and and and, and CI/CD driven approach, which will then have to reflect in this, in the safety architecture. So it's like <laughs> you'll end up having to to give answers to those guys who say, okay, I want to do it this way, and um, yeah, can I make this safe? Um, rather than okay, of course containers can be a tool for safety. Yeah, that's like can C groups help with with isolation? That's that's really not where I, I was mainly coming from. Although of course this this will in the end then uh, I mean come together. Yeah, it's it's a it's a valid point. Yes, I see that the request which I got so far was mainly that containerization were used to isolate to separate, not for having it basically really for security or safety reason. That's how I got approached by use cases where someone, come, let's take a containerization there. Um, other parts, you're right. I mean, that's standard part. And if you don't think about LXC, also about other container approaches. Um, but I think if we solve the one end, uh, we also solve the other side. Right? If it doesn't make a difference if you go either for the one approach or the other, and in this way, it may end up, as you say, as a building block, uh, like Ilana called it, maybe also just say, okay, we, we looked into different container options and they, this is a good idea or not, or keep this in mind when you want to use them. They can help here. They may be bothering you on the other side. Uh, That's what C groups, um, I mean, you could isolate um, in to a certain extent and draw a line between safety critical applications versus um, other applications that aren't that run in an in an automated environment that aren't uh, critical, but um, all of the all of that we like uh, Philip and Ilana are saying we have to start 